Hey everyone, Jack here from Disseminate the Computer Science Research Podcast. Welcome to another episode of our Cutting Edge series. Today we are going to be talking about caching and on that journey with us today we're going to have Yechuo Zhang who will be talking about her paper Civ, Simple and Efficient Eviction Policy for Turnkey Web Cache Replacement. This was a paper that was recently published at NSDI, and it actually won the Community Award, so congratulations for that, Yechuo. Recently, she passed, she finished her PhD at Emory University in the Symbio Systems Lab, and she's going to be soon joining ETH Zurich for a postdoc. So welcome to the show, Yechuo. Thank you, Jack. Thanks for having me. Very happy to be part of the show. You're more than welcome. I'm really excited to learn something about caching today. So it's going to be a really interesting chat, I'm sure. Cool. So it's customary on the sh- on the on the show for the guests to tell them a little bit more. Tell us a little bit more about themselves before we go on to the cool mm-hmm. technical stuff. So yeah, tell us more about yourself and how you became interested in systems research. Yeah, sure. As you already introduced me, I just defended my dissertation and finished my PhD journey this May. And I'm very excited about the joining ETH in the future. And about how I became interested in system research, I, I always personally always thought system research is the backbone of computer science. Of course, there are a lot of fascinating areas in computer science, but to me, system research is like a foundation. So just imagine every click on the website is supported by a huge amount of networked machines and system researchers are working with every level of the whole infrastructure to support our daily digital life. So th- this whole thing just feels so cool to me. And my research starts with understanding the cache performance and most of the initial work is very theory heavy. And then I realized I'm not that very good at the theoretical study. And the turning point was my internship at Twitter, where I got exposed to the real production systems. And the performance problems that exist in real systems really fascinated me. So starting from there, my work has been focusing on understanding the complexity of real systems and then improving their performance, especially in microservices and caching systems. Yeah, so do you think that your sort of grounding, your theoretical grounding really helped you when you actually then moved to the more implementation slash practical side of things? Yeah, I think it helps, even though I'm not a fan of that, but I had to admit it's like the foundation. Like I, for example, for the cash work, there are a lot of theoretical study I have done before and it really yeah. helps me in the future. Even though I'm actually not a fan of that, I, I, I can now do very solid like proof or things like that so i just uh, give up that path <laughs> yeah I, I also agree with what you were saying about systems being fascinating because they are the bedrock of sort of maybe i'm getting a bit carried away but modern society in a way right because everyone's plugged into the digital world right whether it be it or the tvs like every every phones everyone's even washing machines right? everything's plugged into this sort of digital ecosystem and we're kind of we're working on the sort of on kind of ground zero for it right in a way and a lot of people often ask me kind of like oh what do you what do you do and i tell them and they kind of they have a blank look on their faces and they're kind of like yeah that sounds boring as hell but i'm like yeah but every every time you go on your phone you're probably using a database or something like right. that right and i'm like yeah and exactly. without without people like us you couldn't do that right so yeah exactly totally. <laughs> awesome cool so let's talk about caching then so let's set some context for the the chat today and let's tell, can you, can you tell the listener essentially what caching is and what a web cache is and I guess why we need them, right? Why are they important? Yeah, let's set the context for this talk. Context is a kin. And uh, I think it's safe to say that cache is everywhere. And uh, caching in a simple word is just an optimization technique that makes things faster. So in general, a cache refers to an expensive medium like, like DRAM with limited space to temporarily store popular objects. So in terms of web caching here, we, we just restrict the study of caching to web contents like uh, HTML pages, like uh, images and la- other types of web contents. So as I said, web caches are everywhere. So using web cache brings a lot of benefits. It can help reduce latency by caching frequent access to data 
rather than fetching request content from database, webcast can reduce the time it takes to fetch the request resources. So which uh, this lead to faster page, page loads. And also cached content does not have to be fetched repeatedly from the original server, which reduces the amount of data transferred over internet. So this is beneficial in reducing bandwidth costs. So overall, web caches can help uh, provide faster and more efficient and reliable web, web experiences. Yeah, that's, I, I give the credit to cache <laughs> for the efficient and the reliable web experiences. Oh, so that's a great explanation there. So cool. With that sort of context set then, let's talk about your paper and your research on caching and web caching in SIV. So let's start off with, I guess, the elevator pitch for the work and the high level goal yeah. for the paper. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I just mentioned the cache is important for web experience, but how should we design a cache? The essence of a cache is the eviction algorithm. It decides which object to evict when the cache is full. So you have to evict something because you want to store it in your, in your objects. So cache eviction algorithms have been started over six decades, starting with some very simple eviction algorithms, such as LRU, Faithful, and Clock, which were proposed in 1960s. And this area keeps evolving, especially in the past two decades, there are a lot of new algorithms proposed. But among all those algorithms, some focus on improving efficiency, some focus on improving throughput. We found that none of these algorithms are able to balance both efficiency and throughput. It also worth mentioning that cache eviction algorithms are getting more and more complex. For example, many newly proposed eviction algorithms use machine learning techniques to improve the cache efficiency. But this type of work usually brings a lot of uh, overhead, which makes it hard to be actually deployed in production because there are a lot of, uh, like, you need a lot of time to train the data and get the, to make the cache efficient. But cache itself should be a very simple component within the whole uh, infrastructure. So also complex algorithms are usually difficult to debug and maintain. It will give, like, makes engineers, it, it'd be a headache to the engineers. So facing all these challenges and problems in the cache study, the goal of our paper is to design an eviction algorithm that is simple, efficient, and scalable. So this is the goal of our paper. Awesome, Sophia. I know there's, there's a quote in your paper um, that's like, um, simplicity is like beautiful or there's beauty in simplicity, I think it may be the exact <laughs> quote. And I have, to, I have to agree. We're kind of maybe people are often fast to like kind of use it, these complex techniques, machine learning techniques, where obviously it's all the rage to use ML and, 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 and whatnot. But yeah, I like the principles of this approach for sure. There are also a few acronyms you mentioned in there, FIFO and LIU. Can you maybe give us a quick oh. sort of rundown of what those actually mean for the, the yeah. people not necessarily familiar oh, with, with yeah. the acronyms? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should mention that. I always forget I need to explain <laughs> every concept like, to it's people true, yeah. not in this area. Yeah, so for FIFO, it's just the first in, first out. When you have a queue, you insert an object at the head of the queue, and every time you need to evict, you evict the object as a, and a tail of the queue. So that's first in, first out, very simple. And for the LRU, it's least recent used eviction algorithm. So every time when you request the object, if it's already in the cache, you promote that object to the head of the queue. And every time there's a hit, you need to do the uh, promotion. And when you do eviction, you directly evict object as a tail of the queue. So that's the two very simple eviction algorithms. Okay, awesome. So let's talk about Civ then. And what is Civ? Where does it fit into this sort of family of eviction algorithms or approaches for, for caching? Yeah. And yeah, how does it work? Yeah. Actually, I'm very glad you just let me explain what FIFO is because <laughs> uh, SIF is just a, a, just to make a very simple tweak on the basic FIFO queue. So SIF is a new eviction algorithm. Uh, compared to most of the current eviction algorithms, it is very simple. So uh, let's, about how it works, let's start with the data structure. Compared to the basic FIFO queue, Civ has two extra, like two main differences here. First, Civ maintains a metadata for each object. 
to indicate whether or not this object has been accessed before. We call it visited bit. And second, see if it has one extra pointer that moves between the tail and the head of the queue. And we call it sieve hand. So that's just the two extra thing here. Now we can, I can explain how sieve works. In case of a cache hit, it's like if we request an object that is already in the cache, sieve sets the object's visit bit to one. That's all. And in the case of cache miss, which means the request object is not in the cache, then there are two steps. We need to do eviction and insertion. For the eviction, we need to decide which object should be evicted. We start checking the object where sieve hand points. If the object's visit bit is one, we reset the visited bit to zero and move the sieve hand one step closer to the head of the queue. The sieve hand keeps moving until it finds an object having a, a object visit bit being zero. Then we can evict that object. If the sieve hand arrives at head, it, it will go back to the tail and start scanning again. So, so if the sieve hand is basically searching, uh, uh, like scanning this queue to find the object to, to evict. And when, after we evict it for insertion, the, newly, uh, the new object is inserted at the head of the queue. So that's it. This is how sieve works. And I, I think it's very simple, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if I'm going to repeat it back to you now, see if I understood it. So we can have these two additional components over the, the, the vanilla FIFO queue. We have this metadata, which is sort of every time an object gets accessed, we sort of increment the counter and be like, yeah, it's been visited. It's been visited. Does that go as if I access it multiple times? Is that it keep going one, two, three, four, five, six? No, here, it's here only we just one. set it to one. Just set it yeah. to one. So it's a binary thing. It's always accessed on yeah, access, access, access. And you've got this, this sieve, this sieve hand that's kind of going back and across the, 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 the queue. And it said, if it's, mm -hmm. if it's, if it's easy, it's been one. I flip it back to zero and continue. And it keeps repeating yeah. that until it sees zero. And then when we see that it being zero, that's when we would evict that, um, yeah, that object. Exactly. And then we can insert the next object. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. Exactly. My next question is, is how did you arrive at this scheme? What was the eureka moment that you thought, huh, this is going to be better than the normal approach? Yeah, that's a very good question. Like, uh, uh, actually, I have to say, this is, uh, we just found this algorithm accidentally. <laughs> it's okay. like, uh, yeah, it's actually, I, I, I won't conclude that way because we were revisiting a lot of uh, eviction algorithms. And actually, I want to explain this in a bit different way. Like, rather than directly compare SIEV to other algorithms and how, our, how we are confident about the results, I think it's important to, to, to talk a little bit about the design principles here. Yeah. And, uh, and actually it's a long journey here, how we arrive, like here, arrive at the, the design of Sieve. So our whole team has been starting what makes cache eviction algorithm being efficient. And we have found the lazy promotion and the quick demotion are two important properties of efficient cache eviction algorithms. And also I just want to mention this studies have been published in Hot OS 23 and SOSP 23. And welcome to read it <laughs> if you are interested in the details. Then here I'll just briefly introduce the concept because this is the foundation of the C design. And uh, for uh, lazy promotion, here it refers to the strategy of promoting cached objects only at eviction time. When you think uh, about C, you only do eviction, like like you do not actually we do not do active promotion. Like for example, for LRU, you promote every time you have a cash hit. But in Sieve, we don't do that. We only decide whether or not we promote this, like keep these cash objects when we need to evict it. Also, maybe one other example is in the queue, the objects are inserted at the head of the queue and evicted at the tail of the queue. We only decide whether or not we promote this object when we're about to evict it. So this is something we call lazy promotion. And the benefit of it, this, this lazy promotion is it can retain popular objects with minimal effort because you don't need to do it every time. You just uh, save a lot of computation here. 
and uh, it can improve throughput due to lens computation. And it can also improve efficiency because we have more information about that object, but it stays long enough as a queue. So when we do the eviction, you have more information about it, whether or not it is pop. Uh, it's like how the visibility is shown, is it popular or not? And uh, this is a lazy promotion. And the other thing is efficient, efficient eviction algorithm not only needs to keep popular objects in the cache, it also needs to evict unpopular objects fast. So we call it a quick demotion. So it is a fact that most objects should be quickly removed after they are inserted. If you think about this uh, current web cache workloads, a lot of just uh, one hit wonders, which means this object only exists once after they are inserted to the cache. So let's just get rid of them as soon as possible. So this is uh, what quick demotion means. So we found that lazy promotion and quick demotion are two important properties for efficient cache eviction algorithms. But most algorithms don't have these properties. If you think about it, like uh, FIFO doesn't do any promotion at all, and uh, there's no quick demotion. But for LRU, similarly, no, no, no quick demotion. It's just also they are doing eager promotion. And there are some other algorithms, either they have lazy promotion or some of them have quick demotion, but none of them achieve both. And uh, SIF is the simplest design we have found achieves both lazy promotion and quick promotion with this very simple data structure. So it can achieve very com competitive efficiency and throughput based on these two properties. So I think that may be a better answer to why SIF works. Yeah. So I kind of have a few sort of things bouncing around in my mind while you were giving that answer there. You chew. And that well, the, the first thing I want to say is we'll put links to those references you mentioned there in the show notes so the list oh. can go can go and check those out as well so they can quickly have a quick handy link to go and to go and sure. find that. But my, my next question was going to be that these these sort of two principles make kind of intuitive sense, right? And they obviously mm -hmm. you've demonstrated them with Civ that they do improve efficiency and, and throughput. Is, is it you then you said that like LIU has kind of one of these properties but not the other. Is it easy to extend some of these existing other approaches to like adapt them in a way to have both of these properties? It's not it's not that easy to directly change their uh, mechanism because LRU by default is you promote everything to the head of Q because every time you have a hit of this object, it means it's popular. Just uh, put it to the head of Q and uh, make it. A, Stay longer in the queue, right? And uh, this is contrary to the lazy promotion already, right? And for the quick demotion, you have to, like, based on what LRU holds here, you cannot decide how to quickly evict some unpopular objects. So they, they just evict things as a tail because they, they compared to the objects close to the head, those are less popular. They just evicted, but there is no quick demotion at all. Every object has to traverse the whole queue to get to be get evicted. Right. right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's really hard to directly modify certain eviction algorithms to make it uh, achieve both lazy promotion and quick demotion. And uh, but we found like for there's a similar algorithm called clock and also favor insertion. There are two uh, different implementations of the same uh, eviction algorithm, uh, but the Clock is implemented in a ring buffer, and favor insertion is just a single queue. Hmm. And uh, this algorithm has the most similarity compared to us, but they they have the lazy promotion because every time they are they need to do eviction, they check the tail of the queue. If it is objects visibility, it's their low, they evict it. It's one it promotes to the head of the queue. That's all. And we we made changes to by adding one C hand moving in the queue to do the quick demotion. I think if we want to do the comparison, we'll directly compare to the clock. This is the most close, the, like the, we share the most simil similarity, but they don't have, the, these algorithms don't have quick demotion. Okay, cool. Yeah, I kind of, we, maybe we can get into this specific question I'm going to ask in a moment later on in a bit more depth when we talk about sort of limitations and scenarios yeah, where yeah, performance sure. might be so possible, but I want to ask, I mean, probably all caches suffer from this, right? But if you, if if the if your if the sieve cache is all the items in there are really really hot, right? And the sieve hand is mm -hmm. kind of in this situation where everyone every time it goes it sweeps across all the objects, it, and it decrements them all back to zero. By the time it starts to do it again, everyone's yeah. already at one again. 
I mean, that feels like maybe something you can't avoid, but is that a po- is that a potential problem or is it like just in that scenario, get a bigger cash or like, is that what's the, <laughs> what's the way around it? Like that sort of, it feels like a, it's an, it probably an extreme yeah. case, but yeah, how would that handle be handled? I think you already gave one solution. You can have a bigger cash. That's the simple <laughs> solution in, in, in production, right? And mm-hmm. it wouldn't hurt to just add a, a few capacity here. And, uh, but the, the, the problems you are asking here is very meaningful. And we were thinking it's basically can be classified to one direction we will be working on is the adversary workload to seize algorithm. And uh, the, Scenario you just mentioned could be one possibilities. We have to look at because we currently have we we test our algorithm on production traces and also we test on like art, artificial like ZFIN distribution data set that we created. So uh, both of them we are we are like we are the best among all these state of art algorithms. <laughs> but 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 there exist some extrema like like point we are worse than others. Most of the time we are good, but there are some cases we're not that good. Sometimes we are we are worse. So we are working on these small cases, like try to classify, like give the list of what traces specifically are not good at when you use sieve. So for example, the scenario you're mentioning. We we actually haven't found that scenario because every time if it's reset to zero, next time you can evict something. It will not be immediately set everything to one. But there are some cases like the same hand was at the head of queue, but it just stuck there. And everything inserted into the cache will just throw away. So it like it just got stuck as the head of the queue. That that's that's one worst case we, we found when we do the analysis. So for web web workloads, we don't have that extreme cases allowed. So so we're that's why we're good at most of the cases. Yeah, well let's talk about that some more then. So let's talk about evaluation. And yeah. um tell us well, there's two things here. The first of all is like tell us about the implementation and how you went about implementing Civ and how easy that was to do and what system you implemented it in. And then what your approach was to evaluating it and what did you compare it against? Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, so for Civ, initially we just uh, implemented it in our uh, simulator. We have a repo of uh, a lot of cache eviction algorithms and a lot of state of like, complicated algorithms. And we also implement Civ there and do the large scale of analysis across like over, like, there are five public data sets we collected and uh, there are two preparatory CDN data sets. And we evaluate all of them across, I think, over 20 different state of art algorithms. But we show, we show a half of them in the paper because the, because of the limits of the test. And, uh, this is simulation part, but we also implemented Sieve in popular cache libraries. And we, we just searched the most popular cache libraries from five different languages, C++, Go, JavaScript, Python, and Rust. And we found those libraries and we replaced their LRU with Civ. And then we we also use that to test, we use these libraries to test the misratio and see if, to, to, to see, to prove that Civ actually works. And especially we use the cache lib, which is written in C++ and developed by Meta. And the way we, this is a general purpose caching engine. So we use this and the way replace the LRU with C when we test the throughput by this platform. And uh, I will show that our, so in, in terms of the throughput result, we actually achieved much better throughput. It has six times improvement compared to their pure RU, LRU implementation. And also it's just, just the worth mentioning that Matt has a lot of engineers spend a lot of energy to uh, optimize their pure LRU because the locking issue and they have some improvement, but if they change to see if they can easily achieve better through. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Cool. Yeah. So, I mean, I kind of on that question there, on that point really quick there about this been sort of you implemented it in a lot of open source libraries in various different languages. Is that now available for people to use? Can can I go and download the latest caching library for Rust, whatever that may be, and use that in my projects? Yeah, of course. And uh, we have the repo called Cashmo that's 
like how has all the rub holes we did for this project. Besides that, there are like thanks to the open source community, people are just so good there. They they know this algorithms, they implemented it. So right now, I I think I, I haven't come so far, but I well I would, before I was pre pre presenting this paper. Uh, in OSDI, uh, I know there are over 20 different uh, implementations and in, in GitHub and uh, I think over 10 different pro programming languages. So if people want to try out Sieve algorithm, it's easy for them to find a library and plug into their system. And, and we have a website called sievecache.com and we list a lot of the, most of these libraries we found that if people have more fun, this please just uh, submit a PR and we can merge to the website. Awesome stuff. Yeah, we'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. So if there's a missing language out there, you've been told, listener, go and implement it in your favorite language and submit a PR, right? So yeah, yeah. let's get yeah. full coverage. <laughs> Who's yeah. going to yeah. write it in COBOL? <laughs> cool. Um, so I have a question that I normally ask around impact and Okay. How is it, how how as a software developer engineer I can leverage the findings in 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 the work that you've that you've done and what impact yeah. you think Civ can have longer term and well short term and long term but I think we've just kind of spoke about that there right that's some serious yeah, kind of right. short term impacts and I guess the, I guess the next question would be what impact do you think you can have it can have long term do you see it being used widely in sort of production applications maybe it is already I'm not sure do you have much information on that. In production, we we actually don't know. We know Meta is very interested in this work because we already implemented in their cash lift. And uh, for other companies, I'm not sure because this is so simple. And I think if people just want to try it, they won't let us know. They don't need our help. It's just uh, implemented. So I actually think it better. It would be better like we hear from people who are using this algorithm. And another one of the Civ user share some news on the in Twitter. They they report that after switching their cache algorithm to see, uh, they observed a uh, 30 times cache misses re reduction and the 16% CPU saving. So this is good news to us. And that's just the one user report they, they would love to share this stuff. But uh, we are expecting more of these reports. Either it's good or not, we just want to see how it is, like how Civ is behaving in the real world. And uh, It'd be good to know that. And also, while we were discussing Sieve with some researchers and engineers, we do know there are some limitations. For example, because the Sieve hand, we cannot implement it in a RIM buffer. So if companies who are using their cache implemented by a RIM buffer, Sieve might not be a good choice for you. So this is just one limitation we are aware. But in real system, there might be a lot of other stuff, other issues. So we would love to hear and any problems when they are trying to adopt Sieve so we can see what we can do, what we can help with that. And can we make this algorithm even better? Great. So, so yeah, so let's talk about sort of future directions. And so you mentioned earlier on in the podcast about exploring adversarial workloads. What else is on the, on the, on the agenda for taking this, taking Civ yeah. forward? Yeah, yeah. Basically, as I mentioned, one direction is we're interested in classifying the adversary workloads to Civ. And the other direction is the proof about why Civ is effective. effective. So it is good to be to understand the theory behind this very effective algorithm. So we are thinking about the so I'm not sure you're familiar with Biladi algorithm. It is an offline cache eviction algorithm. It is basically, you know the future. You know what's going to be exact in the future. So you know what's the best miss ratio you can get for a cache. So that's an offline algorithm. But we were thinking, no one is doing off offline, right? For, for the real system, we are all doing online. So it's possible to find the upper bound for the online algorithm. So this is what we're thinking, is it Civ achieving the upper bound of the online algorithm? So this is the one direction we are thinking. And the third direction is just that we'd love to collaborate with the people in the industry and uh, to understand all the implement in, like limitations in the real world and to learn more about these experiments and help us improve this algorithm better. Awesome. So if you're going back to your th theoretical roots there, you're trying, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're yeah. Full, you've gone full circle. You've come around the other side of the ring buffer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. When I said that, I was thinking about the same thing. 
<laughs> awesome stuff, Cole. And yeah, so my, my next question for you is, and maybe I can maybe preempt this a little bit, given sort of how this work was found, how you came across discovering this sort of this work. But I want to ask you, what is the, the most surprising thing you've learned while working with Civ and on caching? A very good question. I have also a very simple answer to this is starting with simple approach. <laughs> I, I was surprised to see that Civ is so good. We actually verified very carefully to make sure the results are reliable, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> but it's just so simple. How could it compete a lot of like fancy algorithms, like a lot of queues and dedicated, uh, complicated design? How could this happen? So yeah, we, we, we actually, uh, that's why we, we very carefully checked the results. So but, but the, all the jokes aside, I think starting with a simple approach and finding the essence of your research problems is very important. So sometimes we just need to sit down and do some abstractions of your research problems and what I'm doing, what all the analysis I'm doing for, and uh, try to extract some essence of that and uh, start with a very simple approach. That it, it might surprise you. And yeah. nothing has to be like, like I think sometimes it's just very important to understand the the, the, the logic behind it rather than putting all the data together and put it into the black box and uh, like you don't know what's happening here but uh, for here see even though we found it accidentally but we we have some theories like principles to support this this algorithm that's something i think is important for our system researchers yeah yeah i completely i completely agree with you there that's a great answer to that question cool ne my next question for you Yucho, is that it's about creative, being being creative, the creativity, right, in the creative process. And how are you about how you personally go about sort of generating ideas and then once you've generated them, like selecting which ones to work on, right? So do you have a systematic approach for that? Uh yeah, that's a very good question. I, I'm actually not sure I can give constructive suggestions here. I believe we all have different approaches and what I think here is more about a retrospect and the summary of my past experience. I know I, uh, in the past, I made a lot of mistakes. I wish I could, I didn't do that. So people hear this talk, try to avoid that. So like you mentioned the creative process, I actually want to start with the project selection and then I can talk about idea generation. To, to me, I feel this is the right order. And uh, first of all, I would choose the problems that really make me excited. Uh, sometimes I, I I feel it's really just the instinct. You know, you will know it immediately if you are truly interested in something. Like at the beginning of our chat, I, I, I mentioned I used to work on theoretical analysis of cash performance. And to be a little bit specific, it's more about the, the mathematical study of cash performance calculation. I do, I do some misracial curve calculation. I spend tons of time working on formulas and thinking of uh, popularity theory. And now when I looked back to that time, I feel like I was forcing myself to study. I wasn't fulfilled, but I was very lucky to intern at Twitter at the crossroad during my PhD when Yao, my manager, uh, introduced the multiple po potential projects I could do over that summer. I forgot the rest of the I forgot the rest of the projects she proposed, but I remember two. One is about caching stuff. Yeah, uh, she she mentioned that I can do some data structure design in Redis. That's one project, and the other one is service migration problem. If Twitter build another data center, you guess which one I choose? <laughs> yeah, I think I can maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, when I heard that two options, other options I forgot. I, I know immediately that I want to do the service migration part. Even though I, I, I knew nothing about microservices at that time, and not to mention I need to use distributed tracing data, I had no clue what that is. But that problem fascinated me. And on the contrary, contrary the first problem probably would be much easier for me. And that should be a comfort zone, but I can feel what's more intriguing to me. So I love working on more practical problems. That's a specific problems you can explore, but I just learn a lot of stuff. 
at that time, like I, I can remember all the things I was trying to learn. That's just the <laughs> very fresh. <laughs> of course, it's just a personal preference, and、uh, but I just feel I got excited, so I won't feel like this something I don't want to do. So I can spend a lot of time working on that, and don't feel I'm I'm so tired. I got exhausted. So also. I I understand the PhD students have limited time to explore their interests. So save your time.、Uh, I I found my my research interests basically at the end of my second year. So which means I I would start restarting the whole new research direction in the middle of my PhD. That was very stressful indeed. So at the first two years, one suggestion is exposing yourself to many areas. That would be beneficial to find your own, like like your true true interest interest. So I think it's very important to keep the passion and really love what you do. Yeah, this is about the project selection, just based on what I really like. And next, I'm talking about the idea generation, right? You mentioned、yeah. that、uh, about that. I think now I think back, I I feel like reading papers, of course, and reading technical blogs. Latest tech news, and knowing what 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 has been done and what is happening is, is important. And also talk to people.、Uh, I think it's just the, when you observe a lot of information, you're kind of back processing them. Like someday you you will have the moment you feel there are a lot of things I could try. I know I have that moment, but very later on. <laughs> For example, the intro project I did at Twitter, I developed a tool called Latencyer. Which can estimate the end-to-end -end latency if some services are delayed. So this too mainly captures causal dependency between services. So even though it was designed to estimate the latency, I feel like it it has more potential. But I don't know what it is. So last year, Amazon had a blog talking a blog. They they talk about the how they found the monolithic design actually has much better performance than microservice design. Okay, I know immediately that this tool can help me like to explore this idea, and I I can extend this tool and to evaluate whether we really need a microservices architecture. So this is something we did before, and we keep in mind, and we understand what we are doing. And now you are exposing yourself to new. Problems you keep track of the latest news, especially from the industry. Here, some new ideas pop up. So I think that could be very interesting experiments, and it's not boring at all, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I love that. I love the answer to that question. I like what you're saying about having that breadth, not depth, exposure at the start. Get exposed to kind of a lot of different ideas, so you can kind of find the one that really resonates with you, which then makes. Re working on it easier, right? Like if you if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life, right? As the saying、yeah. sort of goes, and also sort of that sort of like a three pronged approach, or maybe there was a fourth as well. Of like I've been reading stuff, reading tech news, keeping up to date, but more importantly, talking to people and getting exposed, yeah, kind of generating that and setting a background thread off on something, and you never know when、exactly. at some point in the future. You're gonna put two and two together and go, huh? Yeah, that could work. So yeah, no, I think that's a fantastic answer to that question, Yucho. Awesome. So, so Yucho, so could you tell us a little bit more about the the papers we spoke about at the top of the show, a little bit about how this kind of idea came around? But can you tell us more about the courage and and the, and the story behind the paper? Yeah, sure. I I really love to talk about this agenda here. I I I can share the backstory of Steve, and here I would say Steve is a Cumulation of years of dedicated effort. So this is a teamwork, and I I will give a lot of credit to my collaborators. They are all all cash experts working on cash survey for over ten years. And、uh, before C was invented, Jin Cheng, who is the co first author,、uh, he he wasn't here, has been maintaining a cash simulator since twenty sixteen, and it's now called Leap Cash Sim. Implemented in C plus plus, and it has like twenty different、uh, eviction algorithm implementations. And、uh, Jincheng and I both interned at Twitter before. Our manager Yao is also an experienced engineer. She has very deep understanding of how C should be designed.、Uh, sorry, how cash should be designed to meet production requirements. And also, my advisor Emir and、uh, Jincheng's advisor Rashmi are experts. That In theoretical study, so we were the whole team on the path of understanding what makes cash eviction algorithms efficient. 
So Sieve was discovered while we were revisiting a past algor old algorithms. So in the past, we have collected a lot of cache traces, and it's just uh, natural for us to analyze and evaluate things. So now we present this very simple design, but we actually tried multiple different versions. For example, we tried different hand movement strategies to the head, to the middle of the queue, to the, and so on. And with a lot of effort on understanding Sieve 2, we finally present Sieve as what it is now. So it's a long journey, even though it's very simple, but actually it, it has a lot of people's effort in the past decades, even though I wasn't even there back then. <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy. Right? You just you just see the sort of the the paper appear in the proceedings, and then you don't always see the 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 years of research and the culmination yeah. of effort that's gone into it and the collaboration. But yeah, that's awesome. I mean, there's there's no there's no, there well teamwork makes the dream work, right? So like, yeah, it's a bit of a cliche saying, but yeah, it's awesome to see that it was the product of some collaboration and years of of, of hard work. But it's definitely been worth it in the end. You chose it's a really awesome contribution to the space. Cool. Oh, well, we've come to the time for the last word now. So um, what's the one takeaway you want the listener, mm -hmm. the listener, should I say, to get from this podcast episode today? Yeah, uh, one takeaway about this work. So I would say Sieve is the simplest eviction algorithm that achieves both latent promotion and quick demotion. So you can use it to add a plug-in cache for or your like web applications. It's simple, efficient, and scalable. Yeah, Fantastic. welcome to try it. Yeah, you should go and try it, listener. You've been told. I will put links to all that in the show notes. Thank you so much for speaking to me today, Yacho. It's been a fascinating chat, and I've learned a lot, and I'm sure the listener will have as well. Um, best of luck and uh, your postdoc at ETH Eric as well. I'm sure you're going to keep producing fa fantastic work, and I look forward to keeping my eye on it as well and seeing how things progress for you. Of, a, of your career so awesome stuff thank you very much whereabouts can we find you on social media on like x or twitter wherever it's called these days and linkedin where the, where the listener can yeah. connect with you if they, if they want thank you jack and thanks for the invitation here i'm very happy to talk with you and share my story and share the work and people can always find me on x and the linkedin and they can just email me you will find my email address on my personal website. So I'm just easy to approach. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Yisho. And yeah, I guess we'll see you all next time for some more awesome computer science research.